Merakçın ve Mevlüm ve zaman neden episode of India and Men Friendship Lecture Series and I feel privileged to welcome Dr. Diane Negra who is Professor of Film Studies and Screen Culture at University College of Delhi. Today she will share her knowledge and thoughts on the topic Model Keys of Irishness in Popular Culture. In her talk, she will be analyzing the modalities taking into consideration various factors which implicated Irishness in almost everything. Dr. Negra is a member of the Royal Irish Academy. She has held several guest professorship appointments at Brown University USA, the Free University of Dublin, the University of Reims, Aristotle University in Thessaloniki and Tel Aviv University. Her work in media, gender and cultural studies has been widely influential and recognized with a range of research awards and fellowships, including an award from the government of Japan that led to a culture tour in that country. For five years, she served as co-editor-in-chief of the journal Television and New Media. She serves as chair of the Irish Fulbright Commission, as co-chair of the Inter Inter-Academy Partnership Board and as chair of the Royal Irish Academy Working Group on Culture and Heritage. She is also the author, editor or co-editor of 13 books including The Irish in US, Irishness, Performativity and Popular Culture, Gendering the Recession, Media and Culture in, the, in an Age of Austerity and The Aesthetics and Effects of Cuteness. Before I invite Dr. Negra for his talk, I will request His Excellency, the Ambassador of India, Shri Aklesh Mishra, to say a few words on today's topic. Namaskar, uh, very warm welcome Dr. Negra. Uh, let me also extend my special welcome, uh, heartiest welcome to my dear friend, and me and Prasant uh, both five years of uh, Ireland India Council and they are, they are very important instrument in promoting people through friendship between India and Ireland. They are very grateful for your participation. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, this initiative of India Ireland Friendship Lecture Series is aimed at uh, spreading awareness about Ireland in Indian audience. Uh, so we are using Prasanega this uh, program uh, for, through our social media uh, for wider dissemination among Indian uh, people so that they become aware of our very interesting developments which take place uh, in Ireland uh, and in different sectors. Uh, I, when I called on the President of uh, Royal Irish Academy, uh, we discussed about the importance of uh, culture and particularly the creative industries. Uh, in taking India and partnership, particularly the people to people uh, friendship to the next level. So this is a, a very important area for me and that is why the President of uh, RIA was very keen to connect me with you and I am so inspired by your multifaceted genius, uh, the in-depth research you have done so many areas and each one sector by even sub-sector by has tremendous uh, resonance for Indian people. Uh, in, the, in the entertainment sector, in the film sector, uh, India is the largest producer of films. Uh, and also uh, films are uh, a big ecosystem. Uh, uh, they also support a uh, huge industry of fashion, of design, jewelry as well as the co uh, costumes. Uh, and also they are an uh, extremely powerful vehicle for promoting uh, newer technology driven techniques, uh, uh, artificial intelligence driven or animation or gaming or virtual reality. So this is a very complex ecosystem system, uh, developed and supported by our entertainment industry. Similarly, in the field of creative industries, India and Ireland both have very distinct niche areas occupied by them. Uh, also their connectivity through diaspora and also our strategic location, Ireland and India, they have such interesting complementarities. So I am very keen to uh, catalyze a much broader connection, connectivity and much broader 
other conversations between people of India and people of Africa. So I'm really grateful that you have accepted our invitation. And the theme of your presentation today is really fascinating. Uh, in fact, my daughter uh, just came from India and she learned about your program. Uh, she is here uh, to listen to you. Uh, and my wife is here too. So on, the, on behalf of the entire family, we welcome you and uh, thank again uh, President of RIA for introducing us and also your generosity and vulnerability to uh, be so friendly, so kind to us and that you have set to our invitation here as well. Uh, let me welcome you once again. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you just a little bit. Um, I won't go on too long this afternoon. This takes reading glasses for me, so apologies. Um, what I want to do, essentially, is, is recognize that popular culture isn't banal. It isn't superficial. It feels that way. We have to experience it that way. Um, but I think it is registered for all kinds of political feelings. And it's through popular culture. We might be talking about Hollywood films, we might be talking about advertising, we could be talking about popular music, that we unconsciously, in many ways, derive our understanding of the world. Entertainment is a powerful and influential thing. And it's with that kind of um, foundation that I want to proceed today to sketch out, as you see in my talk, um, titled above, some of the modalities of Irishness in popular culture. Now, there's one disclaimer that I absolutely have to make. Um, I'm going to be talking today about powerful ideas of Irishness rather than something that is necessarily sociologically real. I'm going to be tracking the ways in which Irishness is often constructed and sold rather than the feeling of what it means to be Irish, or anything truthful about what it means to be Irish, which, which would require something very different uh, than what I'm doing here. And the other thing I need to say is that because the power of American cultural industries to define identity categories, including Irishness, has been immense, particularly over the 20th century, you could say that the United States had a greater impact in defining Irishness than Ireland did. And whether that's desirable is certainly a different question, but I think it's, it's almost indisputably true. So I'm going to privilege that side of things today, and I'm going to try to sketch in very broad terms an arc from the very late um, 19th century all the way up to nearly the present. And, and you'll be relieved, I expect, to know that I'm not going to do that comprehensively because we'd be here a very long time. I'm going to highlight four eras in particular. I'm going to start off talking about how the Irish were depicted in the popular culture just as cinema was emerging as a medium in the first decades of the 20th century. And then, without too much continuity, I'm going to skip to the very early 1960s, because something happens in the very early 1960s, which is just really important, which is that John F. Kennedy is elected to the White House. And this is a game changer as far as how Irishness gets represented. Then I'm going to skip to the 1990s, a period that largely in this country was known as the Celtic Tiger. And I'm going to argue that, that just about that decade, starting a little earlier and going just a little bit later, but roughly the 1990s, is a critical period for understanding how Irishness gets bought and sold in the global marketplace. Then I'm going to conclude with, with a set of images um, that are much darker and kind of worrying, actually, uh, that we see in American popular culture more recently that give Irishness a new slant. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground historically, but admittedly visiting in on certain key periods rather than being able to, to do the entire 100 years justice because, as I say, we all um, need to leave this room at some point. I would take for too In more than 100 years that I'm concerned with this afternoon, Irish immigration has been a significant element in global population flows. And the image of Irishness, what it means to be Irish, how we think about Irishness, has undergone extraordinary transformations. Now, the first cycle that concerns me, as you'll see on the screen behind me, really originates in the print culture, cartoons and magazines of the late 1800s. Uh, and a lot of this, this representation was extremely negative and extremely unflattering uh, to the Irish. Essentially, there's one big theme here, and that is that Irish peasant immigrants are cast as unruly and unfit for modernity. And there's a lot of consternation in the press, in the US and also in the UK, about whether these new arrivals uh, could assimilate 
or whether they might have a negative influence on the culture that they were they were um, coming into. So many Irish immigrant women in this period worked in middle class households as domestic servants. And they were often represented, as you'll see here, I'll come to the image of Typhoid Mary in just a moment, they were often represented um, as infiltrators of domestic disorder, and that we get a cycle of early silent films in both the UK and the US called Bridget films. I don't know if you would have heard of these. They're not very well known, in some cases, one or two, but not very well known even among film historians, unfortunately. And these were very crude comedies. Um, essentially, they depicted the Bridget, who was a kind of axiomatic uh, female servant in the middle class household, uh, doing something funny because she doesn't understand how things work. So one of these films is called How Bridget Served the Salad Undressed. So her employer asks her maid Bridget to serve the salad without dressing, and Bridget takes her clothes off in order to present the salad. Right? So she doesn't understand the fine points of the culture that she now um, lives in. But another register in the era of eugenics, and this was a very troubling period of eugenics that made distinctions about which immigrants were valuable and which were not, um, associated Irishness with disease, particularly in the real life figure of Typhoid Mary, who was an Irish born woman named Mary Mallon, who unwittingly infected a number of people she worked for with typhoid fever in the first two decades of the 20th century. And you'll see in the image there on the screen behind me, uh, those are little skulls that Typhoid Mary is cooking up in the pan. But, but Typhoid Mary's Irishness was, was well known, and this became a kind of a, a coded story about immigrant influence in the new nation of the United States and a kind of a cautionary tale, you know, watch out for these new Irish people, we don't know what they're getting up to. So the counterpart to Bridget was Patty, and Patty, as you'll see in the second image, uh, was uh, depicted customarily as a rough peasant whose status was unclear, whose ability to take part in a country that saw itself in rather grand terms, the United States, was, was unclear. He was often represented as simianized, as having features that resembled more a monkey than a human. So these were racist caricatures, and, and the one I've put here in front of you today isn't particularly egregious. There are some that are more blatant. Um, but these kinds of images of patties conceptualized Irish people as black or quasi-black. They said, we're not really sure these people are Irish, which reminds us of an important fact about whiteness, which is that whiteness is not just about skin tone, right? It's about social power, and who's at the top of a particular hierarchy in a society. Myself, along with historians, sociologists, and others, have argued that over time in America, the Irish became white. They acquired whiteness. Um, and, and they did that, it's important to know that in the United States, in a, in a racial order that rigorously subordinated black people, right? So I'm not the only one to make this argument. Um, you know, essentially, there is a sense that, that the Irish became more acceptable over time, became effectively more white, uh, because there were others who were perceived to be below them in America's racial order. So it tends to be a commonplace in the scholarship in this area that the Irish went from immigrant others to desirable icons of American life. That they came to be cast, and this is a really fast transformation. If you looked at films like the ones I've mentioned, the, the Bridget films in the 19 teens, they're just horrific, they're racist. They, they invite us to enjoy the misfortune of poor immigrants. They invite us to laugh. For example, there's another film called The Finish of Bridget McKean, in which a Bridget uh, doesn't know how what kind of fuel to put in the stove, puts in the wrong kind of fuel, and blows herself up, and that's considered a great joke. Um, ten years later, the Irish image in cinema had completely changed, and the Irish were giving lessons on how to be good Americans to others, particularly Southern and Eastern Europeans uh, who'd come over by that point, the so-called new immigrants. Um, so it's a pretty quick transformation, an interesting one. I'm not going to labor on it, but I, I think it's really fascinating. So in the films of the 20s, they're often, as I say, uh, already in a much higher uh, social position. And from that point forward, the 1920s, really for many decades in Hollywood, um, the Irish are represented almost always in positive terms. Like, there are a couple of interesting exceptions, and I'd be happy to talk more about them later if you like. But for the most part, Irishness means pragmatism, geniality, loyalty, decency, uh, adaptiveness. And they are, in fact, in many ways overrepresented in Hollywood particularly. They're often also considered to be natural storytellers and musicians as family-oriented. Um, you know, by the middle decades of the 20th century, you've got lots of Irish-born and especially Irish-American film stars, right? People like Bing Crosby, uh, Maureen O'Hara, Rosemary Clooney, James Cameron. 
Karen Lee Spencer Tracy, Jean Kelly, and the image of the Irish in Hollywood is extremely positive. I would even go so far as to say that over time, Irishness gains an association in American life with the status of preferred citizen in a heterogeneous society. So Western popular culture starts privileging it over uh, other ethnic categories that we might identify. Um, so this is a kind of a long process, and I'm really just having to give it a quick gloss for reasons of time here. But what I want to really emphasize is that Irishness begins a process of morphing into a premier ethnicity that is particularly accessible <coughs> excuse me, and consumable through a range of branded goods, which I'll talk more about, um, through St. Saint, Saint Patrick's Day, the global holiday in which everyone gets to be Irish. And it begins to be sloganized, this is decades ago in the case of this last example, through phrases like, kiss me, I'm Irish, right? By the time we get to the contemporary era, and I'm just slightly skipping ahead here to make a point, which I hope you'll, you'll we'll linger in your minds as I proceed, there's a kind of messaging that, that Irishness is for everyone, right? And it seems to me that this makes Irishness stand out. This isn't quite the idea we have about what it means to be French or Swedish or Brazilian, but Irishness has taken up a place in which it is seen as something that everyone can tap into and enjoy and maybe benefit from. So by the time we get to a much more recent era, and I'm talking here um, about the period of consumer genetics, right? Home DNA, Ancestry.com, right? The little kits in which you, you know, uh, you can send off based on a small bit of your DNA, and they'll tell you what your what your ethnic uh, ancestry is. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you an ad for one of these companies, which was timed to be released around St. Patty's Day, uh, because it really lays out this kind of, the, first of all, the pleasure in being Irish, which is often a key part of, of, of popular culture renditions, uh, but also now the idea is that we have this consumer genetic technology that can give us proof, right? Everyone really is Irish. So this is the kind of the, uh, this is what's on offer uh, in an ad like this. obviously would not be biologically majority Irish, right? So one of the things we start seeing in the late 20th and early 21st century is again that the association that had previously existed between whiteness and Irishness begins to break down. And that's happening both in Ireland and other places too. But I wanted to put a quick example in front of you of how the Kiss Me I'm Irish kind of culture has, has, um, has proceeded. And now I'm going backwards a little bit historically. I hope it's not confusing. Um, but my suggestion would be, I'm, I'm kind of leaving behind the early decades of the 20th century here and flash forwarding a little bit uh, to, to the 1960s because it, it's correlated with a really interesting surge in the representability of Irishness. So, so here's how I read this period. So we, 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 we're on the way to Irishness being, a, it, it's already a, a strong identity category that's promulgated through film, TV, celebrity, radio, advertising, and lots of other forms as well. But that Irishness of a hundred years ago that was stigmatized identity, you know, we don't know what these kind of new, you know, impoverished immigrants might be getting up to. By the time we come to the more recent period, the last 50 years in particular, Irishness is firmly a credential, and it's a malleable one that can be fitted to different purposes. And most recently, as I'll talk about later, we can even see it being called upon to enhance or mitigate a whiteness that is increasingly in dispute, right? So when, when we get to this kind of disreputable whiteness, this kind of sense that 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 um, Americans in particular by the later decades of the 20th century aren't feeling so good about what it means to be white, uh, is a point I'll, I'll come back to you later. But 
But for the moment, let me linger in the early 1960s when the election of John F. Kennedy to the presidency. That election helps to secure a sense that's still around today of the Irish as dedicated strivers, as a model diaspora driven from their own country by a brutal colonial regime who have by and large achieved the American dream. And that this kind of positive association of Irishness, and this in terms of the history of advertising, I think is really fascinating, leads two large US companies in this period of the early 1960s to roll out products that have no inherent Irish connection, breakfast cereal and soap, uh, to Irishness through intensive marketing campaigns. So before this in America, you had lots of things that were sold as being Irish, whiskey, lace, China, things that were made in this country and then exported. These products were, had no such association and they could have been marketed in any way. So what I'm trying to find here is that by the early 1960s, Irishness had evolved into a category that was so positively encoded that companies would use it to sell anything, if they could. So, uh, General Mills debuts Lucky Charms breakfast cereal. You'll see that on the image behind me. This is a more contemporary image, but, but I could, if I had more time, show you black and white TV ads from the early 1960s. Uh, and Col Colgate Palmolive rolls out Irish Spring Soap. Both of these products are still available today um, and would have been heavily advertised on American television for many decades. Um, most of the, the, the advertising around these products summons the idea of Irish, and show the cliche of Irish luck, for example. The Irish are lucky, you know, they're genial, they're, they're um, you know, there's kind of heavy of such shamrocks and leprechauns and, and that sort of thing. Um, but one thing to, to highlight about Irish Spring Soap, which is a sort of a <laughs> giant green soap, um, is that it relied heavily on the Irish landscape as a marker of purity and cleanliness. So in a, in a period in which American industrialization is kind of peaking, um, and in many ways you're starting to move into an area, this is the post-war period, you, you've got cities that you know, are, are not in the greatest environmental shape, I'm speaking of things like Detroit or Cleveland, parts of upstate New York, and, and so it's interesting, I think, that Colgate Kamala chose to, to sell soap that, that tried to associate itself with images of the Irish landscape as pure and beautiful and you know, lots of waterfalls and things like that in its ads. Now, what I'm going to show you in just a minute is that this guy here who's holding the, the bar of soap uh, is called Sean, and I think he, he has a pretty clear correlation uh, to the main character in the film The Quiet Man from the early 1950s in which John Wayne plays Sean Thornton. I don't think it's an accident of naming. Um, and he walks around the Irish countryside and he's asked with a sort of, kind of pocket knife. He's always slicing open the soap to show random passersby, like these two people, uh, that the soap is pure and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, but again, you'll see here there's a certain iconography of woolly jumpers and this kind of thing, just sort of saying, oh, this, this, is, this is Irish. Um, so I'm just going to pause here to briefly show you a TV ad uh, for, for Irish Spring, just so you can get a sense of, of how this advertising customarily worked. Ireland becomes pretty adept 
at sort of saying, come to your homeland. And, so, and, and there was always a kind of a nostalgic and lost quality to many popular culture products about Ireland, right? There's always a kind of a, you know, often a maternalized homeland, right? Mother Ireland, or this idea that you've lost something beautiful when you emigrated from this country. Um, and, and, and now with the invention of the tourist board in the 1950s, there's a way to act on that feeling. You can get on a plane, you can fly here. Um, and, and this begins a trickle of Irish American tourism that would later, of course, become a flood. Uh, this summer, the summer of 2023, there are 183 weekly flights between the United States and Ireland. Um, so it, there, there's a sense, I think, that, that um, maybe also in the post-Brexit conjunction, we can see many tourists who opted to make Dublin their base airport when they come to Europe, right? They used to use Heathrow, but they don't want any part of that in the post-Brexit period. Um, in April, just two months ago, we obviously saw President Joe Biden make a four-day visit to this country. Um, whose central thematic keynote was his Irishness and his sense of connection to this country. Really a, a remarkable visit altogether, uh, about which I, I would be happy to say more if people have any questions. Okay, so I'm skipping along here as a must, just in order to keep us reasonably on time, to uh, a different era, and an era in which um, a kind of explosion takes place uh, of, of Irish-themed popular culture material in the 1990s, moving into the era of globalization, a pipeline of Irish products starts to move into Western popular culture. And we can see in this period, uh, I, I, it, it, there, there are many examples I could give. I've, I've been selective here and just given you a few, which I'll move through very briefly. But we might talk about U2, we might talk about the commitments, we might talk about Enya, a friend of the court's Angela's Ashes, which one of the Pulitzer, that's the cover of the book right there behind me. Uh, this book was avidly read, a massive hit, of course made into a film later. And it seemed to really catch at the hearts of, of people who had some sense of Irish history in their own family, or even if they didn't. Because one of the things to keep in mind is that by the time the US census takes place around the, the, the millennial shift from the, the 20th century to the 21st, is that more people in the US census say they have Irish background than possibly could. It's an overclaimed ethnicity, right? So, so it, by this point, it's become elective and it's become desirable. Uh, but I think this, 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 this flood of Irish themed product is notable from the earlier period. I was just highlighting the early 1960s because most of it does come from Ireland itself. It's not just, you know, General Mills or, or Colgate Palmolive. Uh, the troubles, the political troubles in the North, are starting to attract more attention in the West in this period. Heavy, heavy political engagement with this country by the Clinton administration. Of course, by the time we get to the end of the 1990s and the Good Friday Agreement, many would have the perspective that it's American intervention that solves the troubles. That's way too simple, but, but I think that's a widespread belief. A um, couple other examples just to make the point. Uh, you know, we absolutely must include Riverdance here. You know, if, if I had more time, you could watch it yourselves on YouTube, but if, if you uh, look at the first kind of public performance of Riverdance, which is now uh, a nearly exhausted franchise. It's been going on for decades. In fact, I think it's been performed uh, in Dublin at the moment, but it, it's remarkable to see the impression that Riverdance made uh, in 1994 when it debuted at, at the Eurovision. It was, it, you can, this is just the closing image, Michael Flappy and Gene Butler. Um, but I think Riverdance worked uh, on two registers. It, 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 globally and in the US, it became uh, a beautiful and, 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 and seductive kind of performance of Irish. But in this country, I think it also said something about a country that felt euphoric at the time. That the, the Celtic Tiger period has Ireland feeling, oh gosh, you know, all of the things that made life in this country so challenging and difficult have been flipped. We're now prosperous. Everybody's doing well. Again, far too simple. Uh, but, but, but I think that the, the kind of the feeling that Riverdance captures is, is that kind of energy and optimism of the period, which is capitalist optimism, we should say, and also the promise that Riverdance represented that older forms of Irish culture, namely Irish dance, traditional dance, could be productively and profitably updated. Right. So when Flatley comes on, his first appearance on, on stage at the Eurovision, he's leaping in the air. They're both moving their upper body in ways that are not traditional for this form of dance. They're saying, it's a form of dance you remember, but here's a new version of it. And that is the whole story of Ireland in this period. You know, it's the same, but it's better. You know, <laughs> it's kind of new and improved. 
Um, what I really want to emphasize is that across the many forms of Irish-oriented popular culture in this period, notions of political integrity, social justice, and personal authenticity predominate. This was a period in which Irishness was often associated with, uh, you know, with progress, with tolerance, with good government, with uh, decency, and um, it hasn't lost that, of course. Uh, Irish President Mary Robinson famously is elected in, in 1990 and puts a light in the window, R. Sanuktaram, to welcome home Ireland's diaspora. This was a book by, by Joe Biden when he was here. What I want to suggest to you that part of the reason why Irishness is getting all this traction in this period is because Americanness, particularly white Americanness, is starting to not feel as good. And Irishness emerges as an antidote to an embattled Americanness. It says, you know, if you can retrieve this kind of heritage connection, you can feel really good about a country that, my gosh, has been kicked around by history. It's experienced famine. It's very likely you have ancestors who left because of famine and lack of economic opportunity. Now you can reconnect with it at a good time. And I think that's the promise at the heart of, of, of touristic representations of the appeal of people to map their family tree and find Irish ancestors, uh, to you know, let's say eat Irish soda bread or you know buy you know some type of wool product from this country, whatever whatever you like. So my point is, Irishness by the late uh, 20th century has established itself as an incredibly attractive identity category, and as I say, it's one that people who either don't have Irish uh, ancestry or don't know, and that's a lot of people in the United States, and a lot of people in other countries too, but especially the states, um, you know, people with mixed. European ethnic backgrounds often have no idea. When I worked in Texas, which is my first job outside graduate school years ago, I would have students come up to me. I used to teach whiteness and ethnicity there. And students would come up after class and say, Yeah, you know, I didn't talk about this. My grandma spoke some language, but I don't know what it was. They literally had no idea that grandma was, you know, Lithuanian or Polish or, or Norwegian. And these incredible, powerful repression in American life for many, many years, now it's going the other way, uh, on, on, on knowing about one's kind of past, because you were expected to just be really glad that you were in this great you know, country. Now I suggest to you by the late uh, 1990s, this is no longer the case. And Irish surges into prominence as a fantasy available to redress a psychology around the US, which is increasingly linked to a stalled US aspirationalism and a widespread sense of political disenchantment. So many Americans by this period are starting to feel things aren't going that well. They're working hard for fewer rewards. Uh, they are, um, the 90s begin with a recession that left many college graduates under or underemployed, uh, which is the most you know, unprecedented development historically. Real wages peaked in America in the late 1970s. So despite the intense political rhetoric of the 80s around Ronald Reagan, in fact, life for many people in America was going downward. So I suggest to you that the appeal of, of, of Irishness has something to do with this. Also, as the U.S. starts to both perceive and value racial diversity, uh, it's thinking of itself more and more as a multiculture. And some people think, you know, boy, I, I, I wish I had that. Whiteness is kind of generic. Also, it's kind of colonial. Also, it's, you know, it's kind of associated with imperialism. <laughs> it's not looking that great. So there's a shift in thought away from the traditional melting pot idea of the early 1900s, you said, wherever you come from, you come here and you melt. You join a kind of stew, right? And you, you, you gain Americanness and maybe whiteness too. What's happened by 100 years later is almost the reverse. People are looking for ways to find kind of ethnic heritage and ancestry. And I suggest to you that Irishness by this point is a green tinged form of whiteness that many people are attracted to. Saying that you are Irish provides political armor. It connects claimants to a diasporic past and to centuries of struggle. And even though you are white, it offers you a way of feeling that your whiteness isn't shallow or morally culpable. It's a way of hyphenating yourself. This is the flip side of what immigrants 100 years previous, and, you know, immigrants in the, the early part of the 20th century were expected to de-hyphenate. You're not supposed to think of yourself as Italian-American or German-American. You're just American. 100 years later, that's, that's flipped around. So I think it would be hard to overstate. I thought I had a U2 image there. Maybe I didn't. Huh. Um, but in any case, uh, I think we, we really would find it difficult to overstate the romance that, in particular, the US, but other nations as well, enjoyed with Irishness in this period. We get an explosion of Irish-themed pubs and shops 
in this period, right? This is the decade in which the Irish pub becomes sort of a global thing. Um, and this is happening in the United States all across the country, not just in traditional ethnic strongholds like New York or Boston or Chicago. Instead, you've got whole shops dedicated to selling nothing but Irish goods. And when I say Irish goods, I'm including a mixture of things that do come from the sun and the things that you know, just have shamrocks on them or whatever, you know, like a box of chocolates that just says shamrocks or you know, liver cups or something. So it's quite a range. Uh, traditional Irish made, made goods like uh, Guinness. I can't remember when it was bought by Diageo. I think it was around this time, but in any case, um, but, but in addition to, to goods that are sourced here and made here, there's also, as I say, this broader range of things that are just branded as, as Irish. You know, don't need to be, but they could be. So Irishness is, is a strongly positive commercial signifier that can be attached to products almost randomly, right? Because, because Irishness by this point is almost universally a good thing. And you know, if we had more time, we could talk about how that, I'm going to move ahead here fairly shortly, but, but this phase of a kind of romance with Irishness is by no means over. And you know, we could talk about, for example, the season that we've just gone through, uh, where you know, Ireland had 14 Oscar nominations for Irish films and personnel this year. Right? That she's in a was a huge hit. On Colleen Q should have been, wasn't it's my personal problem. But uh, in any case, there's this kind of sense that, that um, people are so very, very attracted to Irishness uh, in various popular culture forms is, is a point I think this is worth um, emphasizing before I move on to a more recent period. And I just put up on the screen in front of me, again, to emphasize the range of activities that flow from this romance with Irishness includes things like genealogy and tourism, but also the study of the Irish language. And as you see in this, this tweet from Duolingo, right, this kind of sense that more people now speak Irish outside of this country than within it is a very telling fact. And I'm not saying they speak good Irish, but they, they, you know, they, they say they do. They have some level of functionality in the Irish language, right? So 42 times as many people uh, learning Irish as native speakers in 2018. So, another way of understanding this period, I think, would be to say that a variety of forms of popular culture exploited Irishness as a way for white Americans to feel both white and ethnic, to negotiate a national identity, particularly Americanness, but other Western identities as well, that in the closing decades of, of the last century seemed problematic or even guilty, and Irishness provided, among other things, a fantasy of political innocence to citizens who, who despite a rhetoric of democratic equality in nations like the US, felt, in fact, that their nations experienced deepening inequality uh, government policies that were problematic. You know, by the 1990s, you've got wars that are more or less openly being poured for oil, scorned human rights records in favor of profit interests, etc. So I see this romance with Irish as peaking right around the millennium, uh, and, and things enter a different register. And it's partly because of 9/11, actually. Although there is a, definitely an Irishness uh, attached to the popular culture of 9/11, which I could say more about if, if people are interested. Um, a positive, upbeat Irishness doesn't disappear, but a new way of speaking Irishness emerges. And it's much darker, and it's really interesting, I think. And it's ongoing, it's, it's very much now me coming, coming close to the present. So one of the things that happens is that this new, new kind of vocabulary of Irishness is strongly associated with the contemporary American angry white man. And this shows us how popular culture is resituating Irishness from a hopeful register as sort of proof that America works into a much more anxious register. Just to give you one example of that, uh, I don't think we can square that one isn't there, is there? I think we're missing one or two of these images. Um, I would have shown you, if I could have, a very dark uh, rendition of Riverdance that was staged by Michael Flatley for one of the Trump inauguration balls, really interesting, in which all the Riverdancers appear in black and militaristic uh, style of dance. It's really very striking. But I think that this harmonizes with Irishness moving into a darker register in things like Game of Thrones, uh, and also in crime and troubles fiction by Irish authors in recent years, including people like Tana French and Louise Kennedy. So, there, this is really a break because for so long before this, Irishness was genial. It was upbeat. It was light. Now, for the first time, it isn't. Um, 
the social justice flavor of 1990s Irishness recedes and it becomes more of a vehicle for articulating uncertainties about U.S. whiteness and an attributed American way of life. And one sign of this also is that as Fox News becomes a wellspring of far-right political feeling in the States, many of its high-profile commentators identify as Irish, and similarly, many of Donald Trump's um, inner circle define themselves as Irish Americans and did so quite regularly. And it became a, a kind of a, a campaign strategy, as you see in this image behind me now, um, that, that the Trump campaign, as it sought re-election, rolled out a line of Irish branded goods to attract potential voters, right? So, so we see the, the, the kind of the Trump um, political machine trying to put across the compatibility between Irishness and a far right political agenda that I think is, is, is worth uh, noticing and, and thinking about. So as we enter the polarized United States of the 2010s and the 2020s, Ireland is increasingly called upon, or Irishness is a better way of putting it, as a sanitizing element in new expressions of white race pride. Uh, these are sometimes pushback efforts against identity campaigns like Black Lives Matter, and they seem to bolster white Americans who perceive that their country is being Latinized to the extent that whites are projected to become a racial minority by 2045. Of the department, I think I did. Uh, the other thing that's happening in this period is we're getting a cycle of, of new um, uh, films uh, that, that, that are also uh, quite dark and that tend to associate Irishness with uh, corruption and despair. That's certainly the case, I think, in the department. And so this modality of Irishness offers it as a sign of conservative political fealty and as a form of pushback, as I suggest, from white Americans, the form of racialized resentment. And it's not the only way Irishness, Irishness is currently represented, but it's a striking new way, and that's why I wanted to kind of um, emphasize it to you. And illustrative of the ways that it's now implicated in this new politics of anger is in particular what I would call a necro-political register. And I hope it'll be clear. I'm going to flip around a little here, bear, bear with me. We start to see in recent years images that include skeletons and skulls and death. And this is new. This is really, I think, remarkable. So before, Irishness was kind of, you know, an unthreatening, implicit mode of white pride. But here it moves into something much more intense uh, with these kind of Irish to the bone t-shirts and baseball caps that give us a new and harder edged representation of ethnic pride, but somehow mingled with images of despair. It's calling for something, but it's also recognizing its own deathliness. And then we get, I think I have a good image here, let me show you. Yeah, it's not perfect, I have a few more, to just bear with me as I skip around, okay? Um, some of these are really quite bellicose, as you'll see. Uh, but I think this kind of American Punisher uh, figure, and the American Punisher is a kind of, it's like a death head image. Uh, adapted from Marvel's vigilante crime fighter uh, figure, sometimes you the stars and stripes superimposed over that death head, and, and, and it's very much an image um, that's associated with the U.S. police and with military and militia groups as a kind of point of pride. Um, and then you get the Celticizing of these images, right? So the, the Irish tricolor over the skull or over the skeleton, and sometimes, as we just saw a minute ago, there's a kind of weird emotionality to this, right? Because the skeleton looks kind of happy, right? He's got a shamrock and a hat and all that kind of stuff, but, there, but, but still, there's a kind of a, an invocation of death that I think is, is, is really striking. This is mostly apparel, t-shirts, caps, and things like that, but also, and I hope we have the image, and now we haven't got it, I'm so sorry, I put it in the thing, but I think we lost a couple. Um, this is the very bottom, let me just see, no, it's not. Um, but also bumper stickers, very commonly on bumper stickers on cars and this kind of thing. Um, so what I want to tease out here is the sense that at some level there's a celebration of abjection in these images. There's something that has gone, moved very distinctly away from the upbeat comedy, you know, and musicality of Irishness in previous decades to something that is, is much harsher in its, its style and tone. And in fact, this formulation really reverberates with other historical uses of deathbed imagery in the past, the Totenkopf imagery associated with panzer divisions of the SS in Nazi Germany is one such example, but there's another one too that I think is a little bit more pertinent. Gosh, why are you stuck getting all these images? I would really like to show you this. Just there a minute ago. Oh, there with me, guys. Well, I guess it's just not there, and I'm not really 
sure why. Um, but in any case, the one thing to know, and some of you will know this, um, is that uh, loyalist self-representation in murals in the North, uh, really like the very end of the sort of height of the troubles, if I can put it like that, I'm not sure I can, um, around the, the period of the Good Friday Agreement, started to use this repertoire as well. So you get loyalist mur murals, I would have shown you one if I could, um, that have these kind of like marauding Avenger skeletons and things like this. I have a hard copy of the image and I can show people after if they want to see it. Uh, but in any case, that was an anticipation of this new necro-political register that mingles traditional symbolism associated with Irishness, caps, pipes, and shamrocks that are now being drawn together with death imagery, symbolizing somehow a new undead Irish Americanness that has a very different flavor. And in fact, and I'll show you this image, which I think you can see. Um, Irish by blood, American by birth, patriot by choice, right? So in this case, really far right uh, groups who are calling upon Irishness uh, to, to validate that they too have a stake in multiculture, that they too have heritage and history and, and this kind of thing. Uh, but again, I think the thing to keep in mind about this imagery is that it simultaneously evokes both righteous violence and victimization. In other words, cast empowered groups white Americans as somehow victims. And this, of course, is key to uh, you know, Trump's political um, agenda and, and, and the far right agenda in general. So I would be arguing that the Irish to the bone paraphernalia constitutes a striking new form of Irish American self-representation. Uh, it's anticipated to some extent by loyal self-representation earlier, but I think it's also kind of its own new thing and unique, certainly, in the American history. Uh, and and it, it's saying something that I very much think we should be listening to, actually. Um, so the, these new representations give Irishness a harder edge. They use it openly as a proxy discourse for Americanness and a basis on which to fortify distinctions of race. Right? The other thing that's breaking down, I think, that in, in the more recent period, is the older reliance on the idea of Ireland itself, not Irishness, as a static and unchanging homeland. So Ireland, as we find this country in 2023, has not too far in the past, you know, uh, had two significant referenda, one on abortion, one on equal marriage, uh, has elected a gay biracial Taoiseach. Many Irish people's social attitudes are more progressive than those of traditional American tourists who hope to come back to an Ireland that they think never changes. I'm seeing a new dissonance between some tourists uh, in terms of the Ireland that they expect to find and the Ireland that is. There's almost a flip, right, where America has always seen itself as dynamic and forward moving, and now it's almost as if at times Ireland is that place and America is the, the nation that's falling backward a little bit. Um, so what I want to emphasize as I make a few concluding remarks today is that for a long time, Ireland anchored a proof narrative of an intact homeland for Irish Americans or indeed anybody who wanted to feel that they affiliated with Irishness. This was a country perceived to be a place where the past could still be found in the present, a site of folk wisdom untouched by multiculturalism and secularization, retaining a kind of simple relationship to life's problems and pleasures. But the conspicuous public support that we've seen more lately and that I've alluded to for equal marriage and abortion rights, you know, partly disrupts this narrative. Um, Ireland comes to represent a new sort of contrast to a U.S that for many exhibits recidivist features and is losing its traditional sense of an always positive futurity. This is an in stark contrast. Um, meanwhile, in the, in, the, in the States, you know, again, a rising set of representations that, in, that essentially try to capture Irishness for white nationalism. And this is an incredibly interesting and significant development, I think. But meanwhile, in this country, you know, the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs is more and more keen to entice and attract members of what it calls the, the affinity diaspora, right? So the old idea that you had to be Irish is being brushed aside in favor of, you know, welcome. You may or may not be Irish, but you don't have to be, right? I'm talking about people who have no Irish heritage, but they like the idea of whiteness. And this includes many people of color. Right. So um, it, it, it's, I think, very important as well that the national self-image in Ireland is beginning to highlight inclusivity more and more. Uh, there's an increasingly open and consistent celebration of historical black Irish people. Uh, Phil Linnett, for example, uh, from Thin Lizzy. There's an immense interest in this country in the um, visit to Ireland that Frederick Douglass made in the past and things like this. We see Irish dance being performed uh, by young black dancers. We see uh, practitioners of Irish dance on TikTok. One of the most famous uh, is a young woman called Morgan Bullock, who is black American with, as far as I'm aware, no Irish 
uh, history. So where does that leave us in terms of you know what what how is Irishness kind of moving and shifting in the 2020s? Well, um, the, the way that I want to conclude is to suggest that we've we've, we've traced an arc. That when where we started in the very late 19th century and the early uh, 20th century, we saw Irish uh, immigrants being subject to nativist racist caricature, right? Typhoid Mary, Bridget, Patty. If we skip ahead 100 years, now what we see are Irish Americans mobilizing racist caricatures as self representations in another moment that has nativist features. So in that earlier cycle, that historical period, Irishness was rendered as a kind of quasi-blackness to invalidate it, to say you don't necessarily belong in this country, you're not even really white. Um, in the second, much more recent cycle, it's a whiteness being asserted uh, by middle-class Americans who I think are very fearful of downward mobility, who are articulating, are trying to articulate their sense of entitlement in almost blood and soil terms, but with tinges of anxiety about the passing of an older economic order and the prospect of downward mobility. So if we go across this long sweep of history, over 100 years, we can see almost a kind of a flipping process in which you know, often impoverished uh, you know, Irish immigrants seeking to make their way in a new country, uh, leaving this country under very difficult financial circumstances, uh, you know, sought to assert themselves as having claims to American identity, but now, in the more recent period, um, Irishness is being used to defend whiteness as a way of pushing back against Black Lives Matter, against the, the identity claims and the social claims of Latinos, for example. It's not a happy story that, I, that I'm concluding here, but it's an important and urgent story if we're going to understand all the political uses to which Irishness gets put. Thank you so much. Thank you.